Welcome to the Virtual Roadshow series presented by Channel Check and Noble Capital Markets. Of the 6,000 small and micro cap companies listed on Channel Check, today we are featuring GEVO, NASDAQ ticker symbol GEVO. Research coverage of GEVO is provided by Noble Capital Markets. Noble is a FINRA licensed SEC registered broker dealer. All Noble research is available on Channel Check. Following the formal presentation, Po Frat, Noble Senior Research Analyst covering GEVO, will ask our presenter a selection of the questions received during the live broadcast. And now, here is Patrick Gruber, CEO of GEVO, to make the presentation. Patrick, take it away. Great, thank you very much. Glad to be here. I hear we got a pretty full audience, which is fun. I'm gonna take you through uh, our business, where we're at, what we're thinking about. First thing is, you know, the forward-looking statement, you know, this is the really the thing, don't believe anything I say and don't go buy stock because of it. Lawyers make us put this in. Now, you all know what the big story is, right? Greenhouse gases are a problem. They're getting to be a bigger problem. People aren't gonna take it anymore. It's about the automobiles, it's about the airplanes, and it's about the trucks. It's not just about the CO2, it's also the other pollution, particulates, and all the rest. That's what we're all about. We're trying to solve that problem. And this is now what I think is going on. When you look at our business and you see the contracts that we've been getting, this, this slide helps to put it into context. It's a mega trend we're on. And that mega trend is that when CO2 is increasing, every time someone burns fossil carbon, you do it, I do it, we all do it in our fuels, it makes fossil-based CO2 in the atmosphere that wouldn't have been there but for us burning it. That's just a technical fact. It's gonna continue to increase technical fact. The middle of this chart, this middle of this page shows a chart from the EIA that shows demand out into the future for transportation fuels. And you'll know that, you know, between gasoline, diesel fuel, and jet fuel, it's roughly the same out in 30 years as it is roughly today, ballpark wise. Now to put that in perspective, the amount worldwide used for gasoline, jet fuel, and diesel fuel is 900. 55 billion gallons. This chart contemplates the advent of electric vehicles. And so when, when I say we're interested in, we are doing gasoline, I'm talking about the hydrocarbon of gasoline, not ethanol, it's the hydrocarbon of gasoline. It's huge. We have to solve that problem. Our whole story, think of it as whole gallons, net zero emissions. We're gonna be part of the solution, even if electric vehicles are wildly success, successful. Jet fuel, of course, everyone gets that. We aren't going to have electric planes anytime soon. We can do a distillate, a diesel fuel project too. We have the technology to do that, but there's so many other people working on that. We don't bother with it right now. One of the things that's happening is that there's, you know, with, by the way, what this green chart means is that this, this CO2 is going to continue to increase at roughly the same rate for the next 30 years. That's going to bring more and more increased pressure on brands. In fact, already brands are already speaking up and saying that they need to do something. I need to, they need to get to net zero or they need to reduce it by 50% or become get off of fossil fuels completely. That's gonna continue to increase. They're making big public statements. They gotta back it up in some way. Well, that's where we come into play. This point I made earlier about we're not the usual biofuel, we're a different kind. We are the actual gasoline itself, the eight carbon isooctane. It is the hydrocarbon. It's the stuff that you, you want in your race car. And in fact, F1 racers use it. It's the jet fuel itself. It's not a wannabe jet fuel, it is jet fuel. What that means is it works with all types of engines, all types of vehicles, it's compatible with all infrastructure. It's easy for consumers to adopt. And in ours, the production process is proven. This is in contrast to the first generation stuff like ethanol where it's, you can get a partial replacement and there's different trade-offs of performance. We aren't trading off performance. Ours are generally higher performing products delivered economically to the business system and they work really well. Jet fuel, gasoline, and diesel fuel in the future. We also can do, we also can supply isobutanol as a gasoline blend stock. One of the things that sets us, sets us apart from most companies is that we use carbohydrates as a feedstock in contrast to vegetable oil or use cooking oil or something. We can use carbohydrates from whatever source. In the US, it makes sense to use corn because it's available. It's got a very excellent carbon footprint and sustainability profile. It contributes to the food chain by the way we process it. 
So it's a good place to start. But in other parts of the world, it'll be molasses or sugar, like in India or in South America or in Europe, it'll be something different. And remember, we were the first to make uh, jet fuel and gasoline from wood sugar. So we can do that too if someone turns up with an economical process. Here's how we make this. And it's important as a concept because this starts to differentiate us from other companies who are in this space. We wanted isooctane and we wanted jet fuel. Isooctane, that's on the far right, that has eight carbons. Jet fuel has 12 carbons. So we asked, hmm, where can we get a four carbon building block? Ah, isobutanol, that's that flavor of Scotch whiskey compared to say a bourbon. We said, what if we could genetically engineer a yeast to quit producing ethanol and instead eat sugars and make only isobutanol, which has four carbons? Because then the chemistry to connect those together is straightforward. We can take two isobutanols, chemistry, eight carbons, mm, isooctane, that's gasoline, or three of them together, that's jet fuel. And of course, you know, the feedstock is carbohydrates. What's the feedstock for carbohydrates? That'd be carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We have a pretty extensive patent portfolio. It was recently valued at plus $400 million by uh, peak value uh, LLC. And uh, that's good. It's grown over the years. I think that uh, we've scaled up the technologies and that bodes well. And this isn't just a hypothetical thing. It works. The products work, performance works, the plant work, we scaled it up. I need more capacity is what I need to serve these contracts. This is just a slide to remind people that in fact, we fly in all these kinds of uh, air vehicles and we've done projects all over the world to get used, to, get people used to the idea that in fact, it is just a drop in fuel, it goes into the system, it's straightforward, no big deal. And uh, Red Bull and the other F1 races have been using our stuff supplied by Haltman Carlos in Europe and they are under a take or pay contract. Tropagora, it just signed up an agreement with us and they're primarily interested in gasoline. Uh, and that's important because when you look at gasoline, that's gonna, that's this is the biggest market segment. And it turns out that isooctane, that's the gasoline component, that's a structurally short product out into the future because uh, the high performance engines that are coming out in the new cars these days are, uh, high compression engines and you need, you know, really high octane levels. Well, guess what? We deliver high energy and high octane all at once for the, you don't, that's a different, that's like take special work to get it from a barrel of oil. Well, guess what? We can make it straight away. That's why Atrofagora signs up with us for the large contract that they did. This is our business system, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, is the source of the carbon. As I already explained, it gets, through photosynthesis, it gets made into sugars and other plant matter like protein. We separate the protein from the carbohydrates. The carbohydrates we take into our plant, we ferment them to make our building block. We, we do chemistry on the building block of four carbons. We make our jeculin and isooctane. One of the interesting things that is that we only make jet fuel and isooctane. We get deliberate products. I don't have any waste streams or crap streams. Now, when that fuel gets burned, it makes CO2 in the atmosphere again, closing that loop. The protein, we capture it. At its, added, its value added protein, a feed product, we get about 10 pounds of protein per gallon of hydrocarbon fuel, per gallon of jet fuel, for example, or per gallon of isooctane. We send that to the food chain, and that's value added. And on a tonnage basis, it's actually more protein product than it is a uh, fuel product. Now, we are setting up a project right now in the midst of, of doing it where we take manure from the animals and digest it with a digester to make biogas. Biogas is just methane. And then we use that, we plan on using that biogas to displace the natural gas to heat our plant up. And of course, we already have two wind towers wired to our plant. That pretty much uh, helps us uh, reduce our carbon footprint. And so on the right side of this slide, you see the concept involved. If we replace the carbon source and we do something about energy, we can get down to really low carbon values, even net zero emissions. That's a big deal. That's what captures people's attention in the long run on the customer side. Here's an example of how this works is that, you know, if we were just, to, this chart is showing how different farming practices in agriculture can impact the carbon footprint. Fossil fuel in this case is at 94 
And if we use the average of all of our farms, we wind up with a score of about 23. If I selected farms who did reduced tilling practices, sustainable practices, things like strip tilling, then I get to a negative number. And if I do uh, people who use drills, they don't plow at all, they just use drill drills and then place the seeds in, it gets even to be more negative. And then there's these other things that are new technologies that are coming. And these are things that like Indigo is working on or Locust, where they, they're gonna put um, bacteria and microbes back into the soil and that helps you know, reduce the amount of nitrogen, increases the amount of carbon capture, it makes the soil more healthy. And if we use their numbers, it gets to be extremely negative. Well, those, we count that all as upside potential. We don't take it into account in our economics. In fact, we generally in our contracts promise about a 40 carbon score, so it's much higher. But this just shows the potential because you get paid for every uh, point of carbon reduction. That's where we see it going in the future. And if anyone wonders how it compares to people who just want to use waste, well, you see waste on the far right of this chart and it's just about neutral. So we can get there. So agriculture is good. You got to manage it though and pick how you play. And that's the point of doing the global certifications and such, where we work with uh, Renewable uh, Roundtable for Sustainable Business and ISCC Plus. Both these groups are auditors for sustainability. They've come and looked at what we're doing, and give it a stamp and verify that in fact it's true. We plan on doing this with the farms who supply us because in the end, that's what we're selling is sustainability, carbon footprint. It is just jet fuel. Sure, it's cleaner, a little higher energy, doesn't have particulates. The gasoline doesn't have particulates, no sulfur, no nitrogen. Sure, those are good things and those are valuable. But in the end, it's the carbon reduction people are paying for. So we've set up uh, a blockchain system. We work with block size capital. We call it Verity Tracking. And what this is all about is tracking how products are, how the raw materials are made at the farm, all the way through our plant, what kind of energy was used, what kind of mix of energy, how much biogas, how much renewable electricity, and all the way out to the marketplace. And I think in the end, we'll be able to differentiate and get paid different amounts uh, for that value. And this, this system, by the way, doesn't just apply to our system, we could be sold to others as well. And so we're looking at that. It's very, it, the other thing that allows is, anyone who recognizes uh, blockchain recognizes that that could lead to tokenization and that's a whole different game to play and it's interesting. And we are the owners of the software for this to track this kind of a thing. Here's the game of Jivo then is to develop big contracts that are take or pay. We know that we currently have about 1.5 billion under contract. This includes Tropagora, Delta, SAS, Total, Halton and Carlos. We have about 600 million other contracts that are in negotiation. I'll give you a little more color on that in just a minute. And then we have other offtakes too, with City of Seattle, Avfuels, Titan, who do supply corporate aviation. Eventually we'll be able to announce who those players are. On the right side of the slide, you see different people who've worked with us to get our products in the supply chain, test them out, make them work. We have limited capacity. We're working on making it bigger. And it, you know, everyone knows we have, who's paying attention to us knows that we have a plant up in Laverne, Minnesota. We aren't running ethanol right now because ethanol margins still aren't very good. We could put a, turn ethanol back on, but uh, I only wanna do that if it's profitable. Um, we are continuing to run our demo plant down in Silsby, Texas. It has 100,000 gallons of capacity for hydrocarbons, jet fuel and isooctane. We're continuing to run that. We're very focused on getting our uh, projects funded and build up our capacity. Here's why, is that right now we have about almost 49 million gallons under contract, under take or pay or other contracts. We're in the finalization stage of about another 30 million gallons. And then we have another about 87 million gallons that are in diligence stages and discussions and people wanting to do something. This is starting to get very, very interesting. And this has caused us to change the business model. One other point in this slide is you'll notice that there it's not all jet fuel. Gasoline's important and it's gonna gain importance as time goes on because as I mentioned, it's in short supply for the future. Here's what we're doing with our, to build out our capacity. We're gonna take, we're taking a developer approach. What that means is we do the engineering site development, uh, we're the technology licensors, so we get paid for that. We get paid for doing the development or reimbursed for doing the developments. 
we also would get uh, a retained equity interest in these projects. We think that in order to fulfill 70 million gallons, we're going to need three plants, one at Laverne for 13 million gallons, and then we have two other sites that we plan on building, each of which would produce roughly 30 million gallons per year. The total capital for that's about $700 million. Now, the way that we're setting this up is that money doesn't get raised at the GIVO Incorporated level. That'd be too darn dilutive. Instead, this is done at a special purpose entity. That's what we're working on with City is to find the equity investors who want to do that. City's done a great job of figuring out how to play the debt game here already. And so now we're, we've been out doing presentations, talking to equity players who are interested in project level financings, project project equity players. And so it's been interesting. We're in the midst of collecting term sheets. Notice I said an S on the end of term sheets. And uh, it's going to be interesting to put this together. It takes a lot of work. Project development people do a lot of diligence. They're going to want to have independent consultants and engineers and all kinds of things done. Plus, we have more engineering work to do. But we're in the midst of it now, and it's going to be interesting. And so it'll be fun to announce that when I can, because these are some interesting players. And so, and we're still gaining more interest. This Trafigur agreement, you know, everybody knew we were going to, the people under confidentiality knew we were going to get them. But the, it's a surprise for people because Traf is, Traf is a major energy player. And so it's a different game afoot. And people are recognizing we're the only guys in town with an ISO octane play that can be done at large scale. We see that with that pipeline of demand that we're going to go beyond three plants, we're already in discussions about that. And it can happen a couple of different ways, either by licensing or more of these projects like we're doing with City. So with Citigroup, what I'd expect to have happen is we'll pin down the equity players, we'll finish off you know, the commitments there, and then we'll start to see getting paid back some of the money later next year uh, for the development work and get on with building these projects. One of the other things in this slide that's interesting and it's important is the deal we did with Praj. That's about using molasses in India, per, the Indian Air Force is the uh, customer at the end. It's for strategic reasons. They want their homegrown fuel. That's what's happening. And that's pretty darn interesting and uh, has potential as well. This is an, on this picture really, on this slide is the picture of what we would do to expand our plant. The top picture is showing what we have currently. The labels are pointing out where we have uh, equipment, where it says number one, that's pointing at fermenters for isobutanol. Now look down below at the lower picture, you see nine and 10. Those are the kind of fermenters I need to add. So for us to scale up, uh, to get to economies of scale, it is not a big technical leap. It's more of the equipment deployment leap. You see that in the lower picture where it's labeled 14, that's where we would put the hydrocarbon plant. Isobutanol goes in, jet fuel and isooctane come out. And importantly, as I said, we don't have, I don't need a refinery downstream of me. I don't need a hydrocarbon, like a big giant oil refiner. I don't need one of those because we make pure products straight away and that makes it easier to go to market. So our business strategy is to play this development role. It is to uh, continue to develop the markets and get big growth and we're gonna get it and we're gonna add more interesting customers as I pointed out uh, in our pipeline. And I hope people recognize the names they should of these players because it's kind of game changing and we'll continue to push forward. Now, here's something that's really important as well. Three months ago for me to have said we'd have 87 or 82 million bucks of cash in the balance sheet, that had been shocking. Remember what was going on. We had money to last us maybe to the end of the year. I had to pay off white box, 12 and a half million bucks. It was a question of, oh, that's an overhang. What are you gonna do about it? Well, I can tell you what, we can pay that off. That's not an overhang anymore. And we have cash to do the engineering and project and site development work. So I don't have to beg for money for that or create additional players who wanna gouge us in the development world. Uh, we, can, we have the money to go do that. And we have money uh, to develop the business and I have money to co-invest at our project level in the city projects if I want to. What's interesting is that when I look at our balance sheet, I don't see a need to raise money anytime soon. Could it be that we, if someone said, hey, we want to do a strategic investment at Jivo Topco, would we do that? We'd have to look at it, obviously, but it's a, uh, we're pretty good shape, the best we've been in in a decade. So it's really good. So what's coming up in terms of milestones, you asked? 
Well, we got the investors at the project level. We'll have to announce them at some point uh, once we pin them down. The diligence work takes time. This isn't for the faint hearted. It takes a lot of detail work. We're making good progress at it. And I think that, you know, I mean, it's hard to say exactly when it will be, but sometime in the next six months. Additional customers should happen this year. I would expect to. We need them to, in order to move the whole uh, project along to build out the three plants. I would have thought they would have been done already, but I'm always wrong. The customers control the timelines. We don't. They're in the final negotiation stages. We have, uh, we'll be announcing the engineering firms. That should catch people's eye too as to who it is because it's not the usual suspects. And then I think that, uh, you know, we'll be having to announce the additional sites where we're going to build these additional plants. Who's our partners? Is it JV or is it purchased or is it an option to purchase? How does that get unfold? And I don't even know the answer to it other than I know I have uh, several sites under LOIs already in confident, in, under confidentiality. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to be doing something around the blockchain. We're we'll accelerate that because, as I mentioned, it's a uh, it's a typical kind of a software thing where we are working with block size capital. This this tool applies for other people, and that's going to be interesting as well. So we're at a we're a, we're in a very good shape as a company. Um, it should be interesting for us. We have something that no one else does. That's crystal clear. We see it clearly in uh, how we're developing the marketplace and the customers and what we can deliver. And our technology is proven beyond what's normal for a company like ours in that we've scaled so many things up. With that, I'll stop and uh, we can go for questions. Oh, by the way, one thing more, one thing more. In this slide is a list of our videos that we've been putting together. We do these for social media. But if you want to learn more about what we're doing, these are good places to go. They're pretty short. And, and they have the different topics listed there. They're pretty well done, I think. We're trying to get what we, we learned as we've done all these discussions with potential investors, that what we're doing is so different, it blows their mind. They can't get over that, you know, what, you're not, you're not ethanol? You're not biodiesel? You're something different? And so that's a lot of what's behind this. And then how to think about looping agriculture in sustainably is a new concept for people too. So that's what you can learn from looking at all these videos. Great. Thank you, Pat. Um, that was Pat Gruber, the CEO of Jivo Inc. My name is Poe Fratt, and I'm the Noble Capital Markets Research Analyst who covers Jivo Inc. And uh, what we'll do, Pat, is we'll go through some of the questions that have come in uh, while you were talking and also in advance, and then I'll have a couple of my own. Um, why don't we, first of all, thank you so much. This has been a very popular program. So um, it, it did max out as far as the number of attendees, but it will be available on recorded. Uh, Pat, why don't we start off with the supplied portfolio? Um, you know, it, right now it's just under what, 50 million gallons per year. And it's a good mix of not only, AB, um, you know, SAF, but also on the renewable gasoline side. What are the parameters or what are the, the you know, performance? What, what do you have to do to make sure those contracts stay intact? Well, there's, uh, there's a series of conditions precedent. For instance, we have to pay financing to build the plants. We've already, I think, met the uh, basic commission conditions precedent in some like the Tropicura Agreement with the, what we have under LOI already. And so I think we're in pretty good shape on those kinds of things. The big one really is getting the financing in place. And so, and then you got to go build the plants. Then you got to turn the plants on, make them run, and then deliver product. But that's kind of how it works. Yep. And then, you know, recently you you have talked about you know getting production online by the no. I guess the way you put it, it is um, no earlier than uh, late 2023 or early 2024. Does yep. those that timeline is effectively meets all the contract terms? Does it not? That is correct. It does. So, so if you were out in that timeline, then you know the contracts would be intact. There wouldn't be any outs on the part of customers. Right, right. And it's it's uh, and so what we do, we we knew that we were gonna. The strategy has been to use take or pay contracts to arrange financing and then go build plants because we simply there's no way we can raise that money at Jivo corporate level and just put it under our control. By the way, just as a tidbit for people, 
It's $700 million to build out 70 million gallons of capacity on a fully loaded project basis. That's $200 million of equity, $500 million of debt. That's what the Citigroup is working on. If I did do it on my own balance sheet, it would take like $525 million or something because I don't have to do all the crap related to project financing. But it's a better deal by doing them in special purpose entities. We knew we were going to have to set those up. It's not practical, reasonable that we could raise that money at GEVO corporate level. It doesn't even make sense. The idea then is to do it at a special purpose entity where the investments go at that level. We own some, we own it. We own some cash flow streams from it. You know, we own pieces of it. Then we get paid for services, the licensing, the operating of the plants, because there's no, we're the, we're going to have to operate them. People don't know how to do this, so we're going to have to do it. Um, and that works, and that's where we'll raise the money. But you Great. need take or pay contracts for that. You got to have take or pay contracts for that. It's one year. We leave one year of financing, and then two years to build plants. Ballpark. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Something that you can that the financing will be backed by, you know, right. some security. Um, and then when you look at your your contracts under negotiation, I think it's just a little bit over thirty million. I was it's weighted more towards SAF. Um, it, it, do you care from the standpoint of whether it's SAF or whether it's renewable gasoline or drop in or blending? Is there, are there different economics between the different products? From a production standpoint, no. And then we have the ability to move our product mix from, you know, 50-50, ga you know, gasoline to SAF to 80 SAF, 20 gasoline. And we actually have some some routes that we can make 100% gasoline if we want. So it's not critical from a production standpoint. It's about, it's the same cost. The We do care about the marketplace and margins and risks. So we don't, I thank God that we are not all in and have only SAF to depend upon. Because, you know, these guys, are they know that they have to do something. The air, airline industry itself doesn't want to do anything. And, of course, right now they're not financially capable of doing anything today. They know they're going to be held accountable in the long run. And so they're not fundamental people. The people who supply them are fundamental people, though, in the supply chain. That's where the demand is coming from. And that's what's interesting for us. And I think you'll see it once we announce the next set of agreements. And then on the gasoline front, it is literally a structural short. Think about what's happening in the marketplace. The demand for premium gasoline, you know, the 87 to, or see, the, the uh, 93 plus octane level is increasing because new cars have high compression and they need that high octane gasoline to get their mileage. Well, the normal way that oil companies would fix that problem is to make a product called alkalite. Well, it turns out alkalite capacity is pretty much maxed out. In fact, there's there are some new plants being built, but that's in essence what we make. Alkalite is really like premium gasoline. And so we're working on the segment that's growing in the gasoline pool. And that's what's interesting. That's what causes Trafagora and others to be interested. And then, Pat, could you talk about, you know, if you can, in maybe just broad terms or as detailed as possible, you know, what you think your production costs might be looking at until 2023, 2024? And then also in the context, you mentioned your contracts build in a 40 uh, carbon carbon improvement or CI score. And can you can you give us an idea of how much that's worth currently? Uh, sure. So a carbon score of a uh, of 40 would be a reduction of 60, and they're worth about two cents each. So that right there is about a buck 20. Then throw on top of it, uh, you have uh, RFS, and that may call that 50 cents or something. And then throw on top of that the blender's tax credit. So you've got a few bucks a gallon to work with there. And we share the the way we price stuff is all the almost every contract is slightly different but some of them have they all have a principle of you pay for the hydrocarbon and then pay for the green value and we share some of the green value so that people are all aligned with us what that does it allows us to get profit to come back to our to to Jibo so we can build more plants and pay for projects but it allows them to take a net out and so they get pretty darn close to parity on the uh products that they're buying from us. 
And so it's pretty interesting that it works. The economics look like they work with room to spare and some cushion. Now, to give it a, a finer point on it is that, as an example, the one of our contracts, like Halteman, we've talked about it publicly. It's 450 a gallon as the price, FOB by gate. And I get to keep 100% of the green value, which is worth two to three dollars a gallon. It's extremely profitable. And that, of course, uh, you know, we don't need the green value to be profitable. This is straight up at 450 at my gate, we're profitable and can build more plants. And so without telling you what it is, if you do the math, you know, and start to figure it out and give reasonable paybacks, you could probably piece it together. But we're we are in a good competitive position for renewable resource-based hydrocarbons. I think we could beat when we could tie or beat any any approach, I think that I can see. And we've, and we've done those studies and we're working with partners who've done those studies. So that's what's interesting in helping to cause traction is that the, uh, uh, the, 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 the confusion and, and fog of war has been cleared. There's only a few technologies that can work. We happen to have one of them. Okay, and then great. If you can talk about some of the milestones a little bit more, Pat. Um, you talked about equity players announcing within, you know, within six months or so, probably, you know, by the middle middle next year or th the second quarter of 2021. Yeah, I would say that for the for the city process, we call that project Gatsby. By the way, that's just the name of it. We had to name it something. It's called Gatsby Project. The three plants, $700 million. So Gatsby, we'd expect investors for Gatsby to be named. Gosh, I, I hope it's in six months. I don't know because you don't know what the world, it's uncertain. But like I said, we're in the midst of, in the, we're already collected term sheets. And so good, our baby is pretty. You know, there's people who like it and it plays. That's good. How will we actually execute it? That's a good question. Will we do it in, you know, it'll be three different projects. will be structured as one super entity, as a subco. I don't know yet. Those are all discussions that have to happen. And, and we've got to put together the right group of investors to make it make sense. Although we have one group, one, we have some investors who might do it themselves. So I, I don't know how this is going to unfold yet. And we still have more work to do in working with more investors. Because remember, we've got bigger visions than just three plants, too. So it's getting interesting. It's got traction. Now, we so the way that that will work is that eventually, once we get to definitive term sheets, we'll be able to announce who it is, how it's playing, how we're doing it, how we do the debt part of it, which is in really good shape, I think. And then um, by the time we close it, the first close would probably be about a year from now, where we actually get paid back money and get income. And of course, when we get that, if we if that were if that were to occur, when I expect it to occur, that actually would you know uh, make us on the, close to profitable even by then so because we get paid back for our stuff that we've spent in terms of development and that's a typical developer model we'd be recycling the capital so it makes it pretty darn interesting so that's what will happen um and of course you know two million bucks a lot of money and we got to get people to cooperate and some of the people are strategics and we'll see how they all want to play one of the things I, that is possible is that you'll have people who are smart and they'll say, hmm, I wonder if I can invest in Jivo corporate level. Well, we have to figure that out. What deal would we do? Clearly, we're not going to, you know, it's going to be at above a price where we're at now because it's too low. But, you know, it's that kind of stuff we have to all sort out. I don't know. You know, that's, we'll see. And then in terms of other milestones, I think the customer ones are really important. Uh, they're the ones that drive the business. They're doing take or pays. That's what drives the financing, causes the interest, catalyzes more players to want to participate. And that should happen this year. We should see those. And then you you mentioned engineering, an engineering firm or firms. Um, mm -hmm. Can you, I didn't hear a timeline on, on when you actually expect that to either be an engineering firm to be either engaged or announced. We're, we're vetting firms right now. We have proposals from firms in our hands right now. It's a matter of choosing. And uh, now now that we, it would be relatively soon without saying, yeah, I would I would expect, you know, so, you know, within 60 days is what I would guess. We probably would want to pull that trigger and maybe even sooner. 
Okay, great. And then could you, Pat, could you describe, you sort of just mentioned it a little bit before about just how you, a year from now, you expect to recoup some of the development costs that you've had. In your slide deck, you, I think, showed one figure that showed the IP portfolio valued at 400 million plus. Mm -hmm. Clearly, that would not be recouped up front uh, all in one chunk. How mm -hmm. long do you th do you think you'll be able to fully recoup that? And you know, over what kind of time frame? Maybe if you could sort of give us a little more detail and sort of how how that development those development costs get recovered, and then maybe also talk about how your you know your technology licensing, your development and construction management, how those how those income streams might work too. Sure. So on the licensing, remember, it's not a that's not our recoup. The IP valuation is simply based upon the IP portfolio we have and looking forward. It'd be worth that to anybody. So that's different than recouping it, right? And so what we do recoup is the capital of development. So for instance, we have to spend, you know, five million bucks on engineering, we get paid back that five million bucks. We might contribute, we might do, you know, some other piece of something that we throw in there, we get paid back for it. We have to do a, maybe we'll, I don't know if we're going to JV our next plant sites or if we're going to do uh, a purchase. If we do a purchase, it's going to be some option. Well, we get paid back for the option because uh, that deal, if it was being uh, purchased, it would only close once the financing closed on the big project. So it's stuff like that. Um, we have to do site development work. We have to work on permits. We have to do a variety of things. So those are all things we get reimbursed for. For the licensing, that is a straight up licensing fee. You get paid some at the initial close and you get paid along the way too as the project progresses. We have a construction management fees that we get paid for. We Because we're gonna be the project overall uh, contractors, my group, is one of the few groups in the world who've ever built these kind of big plants before, and they have a track record of it. And uh, we're gonna be the ones overseeing it. There's not that many people who know how to cross over between a fermentation business and a chemical plant business, but that's what our group knows how to do. And then I think we'll see uh, ongoing operating management fees and such. So that's what creates a pretty big cash flow stream. So when you think about what an enterprise model might look like for Jivo, you look over a 10-year time frame, if those greenhouse gases continue to grow, and we're talking about already, I can see 100, well, almost 200 million gallons in contract discussions, and we're at the beginning. You're talking, this could go big, you know, it could go very, very big in the billions of gallons. And uh, it's going to be a, in, in, in a relatively quick time frame. Now, what does it depend upon? If oil's at 20 bucks, it's going to go slower. If oil is at 55, it's going to go pretty damn fast. If it is higher than that, it's going to go way, way, way fast because now it's like cheaper to use our stuff. So if green value goes up, which it is around the world in general, that helps drive the adoption and commercialization. Legislation, I think, is now, you know, LCFS type policies are good. California has been good. They've been a great catalyst in causing uh, the focus on reducing carbon score. Well, that kind of law has been passed in New York. They still have rulemaking to do. But it's being talked about in many other states. It's even being talked about at the national level. I don't know what will happen here. But those are all good things. The EU Red policy, EU Red 2, it's very good at driving carbon reductions. And people are held accountable for it. So I think that companies are going to be held accountable for their carbon. And how it manifests themselves in terms of how they value it is going to be different from place to place. Bottom line is carbon value is going to increase. I think oil in the long run is not going to stay down at 20 bucks. It's going to go up, or it's 30 bucks today, I guess, but it's going to go up. And uh, we're in a pretty good position to make a very big market. And when you do that, it's a big business. It's just going to take a lot of capital, hence the developer model. What You have currently just over $80 million cash. What, can you just talk about how much cushion that gives you and you know how you i think you alluded to it but how you're going to address the convertible debt um, maturity that's either december or potentially even as late as april next year yeah so it's 12.5 million that we owe to white box that the note is due on december 31st and you know right now we just pay it off is what we would assume 
and that makes a lot of sense. And uh, good, that overhang is gone. I have the money to do that. That should be gone. And that's a relatively straightforward one. And then in terms of how much cushion we have, it's a, it's quite a bit. So when I go through all my different planning scenarios, look at my cash flows, what we can do, how we make money in the meantime, or how we defray, you know, think of it as defraying market development and investment costs, because we're having to we're having to do engineering and we're having to do uh, market development work. We have to. It's a lot of this is hard. We got to teach people that in fact, no, this is not ethanol. This is a different kind of a product. It's a hydrocarbon, high performing. It's, it takes a lot of work, and. Um, you know, and I look at, I'm looking at one right now as I look up on my screen and it's like, you know, it's, I'm hard pressed to come up with a scenario where I would say I have to raise money anytime soon. I don't see it today. What I did mention though, is that what if a strategic comes along and says, we're going to invest in you? Would we take the money? I don't know. I got to see the deal, but strategics are good. I like strategics, the idea of one as long, you know, as long as it's the right one. I like that. And so, so we'll see. Yep, Pat. Just to clarify, that you know, that you think that you have enough uh, cushion to make it through the financial close next year? Oh, easy. You alluded to the fact that the project financing on the debt side is has made good progress, and you know, is can you sort of uh, expand on that comment and sort of tell us whether there's going to be any? You know, could we get project financing approved uh, before? you know, announced before the equity investment or investors or sort of what's the gating factor there? Uh, it's going to be done in co cooperation with, I think, in tandem with, because sometimes the you know, equity investors, some we've set it up for 70, 30, right? Some, uh, so, some might want it different than that. Maybe they want to put more equity. Maybe they want to do less, or maybe they, I don't know. There's a, there's a variety of ways to play it depending upon who exactly it is. Um, and so we, those things will go in tandem. But there's definitely a marketplace for this kind of debt for doing renewables. That turns out to be a focus area for people these days. City's done a good uh, job of boxing it and saying, here's what it looks like. Here's what it could do. It's good. It's a reasonable price. And then we have, uh, you know, those equity players are interesting because it's quite, it's, 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 it's going to be, they're good. It'll be interesting to see how it all unfolds. And, uh, and of course, already we're discussing what do we do for the fourth plant? Beyond the three that are in Gatsby, we're already starting to talk about a fourth plant. It comes up. So it's good. The traction is good. What I want and got to have is these more of these contracts done because that is the proof in the pudding of someone saying, I will put my balance sheet against the offtake. And that's what is financeable on a project basis. And that also then dictates how that debt looks along with the equity. Okay, great. Any any uh, parting thoughts or anything that you think we didn't cover that you'd like to cover, Pat? Well, it's a, uh, uh, this, I'm gonna reiterate this again, compared to where we were, you know, several months ago, we're staring in the face at the end of the year, paying off white box. We have to, you know, we got COVID going on, so who knows how that's going to turn out. We have to do development work, the engineering, site development work, permitting work, market development work, and all the rest. We've got to pay for that, too. And so, you know, you look forward, and it's like, hmm, how are we going to skin this cat, and are we going to eat by? The alternative would have been to just go to people and get, you know, really high cost uh, uh, financing, super high cost. And it's, it's risky as heck. And we don't we lose control maybe you know so it's stuff like that well look fast forward to where we are we got 80 almost 82 million bucks in the balance sheet as of today we have enough money to do the development get the projects the first closings done uh it's looking again at my the cash flow we're in good shape and so uh this is good the destiny is now in our hands versus being at the mercy of other people that's a big deal and we're on a sweet spot of traction. Carbon value is increasing. Oil price is drifting upwards and will continue to do so. Companies know that they're going to be accountable for carbon, so they have to do something. And we're seeing energy players step into the space. Tropagura is an example directly with us. They're an energy player, one of the biggest. So, you know, we're in a sweet spot. And the thing is, we can do whole gallons net zero emissions. 
This isn't a this isn't a fantasy. This is real. We can do it. Perfect. Well, Pat, that's all with the time we have for today. Uh, thank you for helping us get a better understanding of GBO's history and future, which we think is very bright. If investors would like to get independent, get the independent research that we published on GVO Inc., please go to channelcheck.com. Again, I'd like to thank uh, Pat Gruber, the CEO of GVO Inc., uh, for his time today. Thank you, Pat. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you for participating in this virtual roadshow brought to you by Channel Check and Noble Capital Markets. Log in to Channel Check or subscribe to our YouTube channel to get the full catalog of roadshows and C-suite interview channel casts. Register for Channel Check's no-cost premium content and receive notifications of new releases from both series. Again, thanks for joining us.